It is now my distinct privilege to introduce this year's visiting professor, Dr. Nick Flint. Dr. Flint graduated from Brigham Young University, summa cum laude, in 2018, where he majored in neuroscience. He received his MD from University of Utah in 2022 and is already a member of Alpha Omega Alpha, to which he was inducted in 2020. He's currently completing his residency in dermatology at Geisinger in Pennsylvania. And really, the one thing we love to highlight, Dr. Flynn has experienced a meteoric rise in medical education since 2018, when he used his self-taught computer programming skills to revolutionize a flashcard app, Anki. Under the title of The On King, he has cultivated a tremendous following ranging from pre-med to medical students, and his YouTube channel, as of yesterday, has almost 67,000 subscribers. The On King's mission of providing free and easy-to-access studying resources for students has had a profound effect on med medical education, and I can confidently say he has had a positive impact on every student in this room and will for years to come. We're so thankful to have him here to speak about his journey. Well, thank you. That was really nice of you. Um, I, I am honored here. And as you can imagine, I was extremely excited when I got the invitation to come and do this. Um, and I'm looking over the pamphlet here of many others here. And I'm also very humbled to be here. Uh, in many ways, I think I might be the least qualified physician in the room. Um, I, but uh, I'm really excited. So I, we kind of decided what, what should I talk about today? And I wanted to share my journey, but a couple other lessons I've learned along the way. Um, and I titled this Breaking the Mold, uh, Chasing Passion Over Conformity. Uh, I feel like a lot of times as we're in medicine, and I'm sure many of you have felt, we're kind of pushed into becoming a certain type of person, uh, a certain type of student, a certain type of resident, uh, applicant. Um, and many of us, you know, that can be stressful. It can affect our mental health. Um, and today I want to share my story with you in hopes that I can help you to reject that pressure that we feel to conform to those norms um, and to find your passion and help you use that to change the world. Here, I wanted to start with, uh, this is a book uh, that I think is fantastic. If you haven't read this before, it's called How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen. Uh, he kind of looks back on his life and is asking the question of how do I measure if my life was successful or not? Um, he always wanted to be the editor of the Wall Street Journal. And he kind of talks about how he was trying to check the boxes to get to that point, but sometimes was being offered opportunities that maybe took him on a tangent or took him elsewhere. Um, he here, one of the things he said in here is a great quote. He says, if the decisions you make about where you invest your blood, sweat, and tears are not consistent with the person that you aspire to be, you'll never become that person. Uh, he also observed that he's concluded that the metric by which God will assess our lives isn't dollars, but the individual people whose lives that we've touched. Um, he actually went on to become a Harvard business professor. And even when he was offered the job of, to work at the Wall Street Journal, he turned it down. He found that he ended up where he really wanted to be all along. Um, and his specialty, one of the books he wrote was The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, he was uh, a specialist in uh, disruptive innovations. And so one disruptive innovation I want to talk about today is Anki. Uh, so how many of you have heard of Anki? Raise your hands. That's a pretty good number. That's more than I was expecting. That's awesome. Okay, all of you that are medical students in the room, raise your hands. If you used Anki, keep your hands up. Well, that's pretty good. If you used the Anking deck or the Zonki deck, keep your hands up. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. Okay, you can put your hands down. So those of you that don't know what Anki is, you guys can raise your hand now. We've got a couple of you. Okay, so you're all wondering why they invited somebody who's not even board certified yet to come and talk to you. That's okay. Um, so, well, for those of you that, uh, that don't know what Anki is, it's a spaced repetition flashcard app. Um, it's free. It's open source. So it combines flashcards with spaced repetition. You can study a flashcard today, tomorrow, then in three days and seven days and so on and so forth. Um, and it got to be quite popular in medical school, as you can see. Uh, many medical students are using it. Now, I didn't create Anki. Uh, you'll see I kind of became part of the world later on. Uh, but my story actually starts before Anki, when I was a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Taiwan. And part of that is I had to learn um, how to speak Chinese. Um, so we had a language plan. There was three books that I went through. The first two were learning, and I used the pinyin and had to learn the regular language. And then the third uh, phase was learning all of the characters, which you can imagine is quite a bit. Um, I actually went back as I was preparing for this and found the picture of my flashcards. I still have these. They're back at my parents' house. And what I thought was extra funny is you can see right here on this piece of paper, I had, uh -oh, um, I had actually written out the tunnel method, which is a version of spaced repetition 
Um, so I had separated all my flashcards into little boxes. You can see with all the cards there. And I had written on that piece of paper on day one, I'm going to study set one. On day two, I'm going to study set two. On day three, I'll study set three and day one, um, and so on and so forth. So I had actually started using spaced repetition before I even really understood that it was a thing. Uh, but I found that it worked really well when I was studying uh, for Chinese. Uh, now, like many of you, I always had the dream of becoming a doctor. Uh, I was very good at math from a young age, as you can see. Um, <laughs> And uh, this is a photo when I started working as a medical assistant with my dad, who uh, actually just happens to be here today because he's helping us out with our newborn. Um, and so I was working for him and just absolutely loved it. We weren't great at taking selfies yet. That's why it's a little blurry. Uh, but I always wanted to become a doctor. My story is very similar to all of you in that, in that way. I also, something that was very passionate to me, uh, was doing humanitarian work and global service. Uh, my dad had taken me on many trips with him. Uh, it was something that was very important to him. In fact, when the earthquake happened in Haiti, uh, he left and signed up to go down there. And I still remember him telling me before he left, he had no idea how long he was going to be there. Uh, he had no idea where they were going to stay, where they were going to get food. Um, and I really admired that. That was something that I have always wanted to do. Um, and I don't bring this up just for the feels. I'm going to tie this in later. But this is something that was really important to me. Uh, in fact, when I was interviewing for medical schools, I was looking for medical schools that had a global health track and could help me to continue to expand on this interest of mine. All right, well, I got to the MCAT, like all of you, it's quite a daunting test at the time, and I decided that I was going to start studying. Everybody told me I should use Anki because it's a fantastic flashcard app. So I started using it, and they decided that it was terrible, and I was going to start using Quizlet because it was too difficult to use. Um, I got really frustrated using it. And for the few of you that raised your hands that aren't familiar with it, this is why. So this is what Anki looks like. Looks like it was designed maybe back in the 80s. Um, this is my actual collection. You can see I'm studying uh, some dermatology stuff now. I've got my medicine flashcards. I've got some Chinese ones in there. Uh, this is what the browser looks like. This is what was particularly frustrating to me. Uh, this is where all of your cards live. I have about 80,000 of them, so you have to keep them organized. Um, on the left side here, you have like you can do custom searches, you can do flags, tags, note types, decks, uh, like the note state. Uh, there's all sorts of different things you can do on that side. And then the right side, this is where all the cards are. And you can organize the columns. There's like 20 or 30 different columns you can turn on and off. Uh, and then in the editor, of course, you know, there's a whole bunch of buttons to customize your flashcards. It's really powerful, but it is really confusing when you pick it up for the first time. And so what the flashcards look like, so they're really cool. Um, you can kind of do a fill in the blank. This is a flashcard from the step one deck. Um, it's really cool because I can end the same flashcard. I can have another one where I'm testing a separate part of that sentence. And I even have a nice hint here, which is really cool. But when you start using it, it looks like this in the editor. So you have uh, multiple brackets and you have C1 and C2 and you've got lots of colons all over the place. And it doesn't really make sense, especially if you're not a uh, very technologically uh, literate kind of person. This is the tags, and you can see, again, lots of colons, um, and, and this makes it into sub-tags, but when it's on the card, it's all one line. Uh, you also, when you start learning, you have to learn what it means to mark a card, flag a card, suspend a card, bury, forget, reposition. It might be helpful to learn what it means if a card is learning or graduated or relearning, uh, mature. So there's a lot of terms that go around and float around the community, and I see a lot of the medical students are kind of laughing and, and nodding their heads because uh, we've all been through this. Um, Oh, and then this is some of the settings. It's not all of them, but this is what the settings look like. So it's confusing. Um, well, when I started medical school orientation, and it was kind of fun to talk to some of the medical students today because they had the same experience as me, there was an upper level medical student that said they got 100th percentile on their board exams by doing flashcards for a couple hours every day. And I knew I was kind of interested in competitive specialties. So I said, great, sign me up, let's do it. And I kind of jumped in with two feet um, and decided to really learn how to use it well this time. And I found out that it worked really well. I started doing really well in all my classes. Um, as you can see, I have done, it's kind of dark here, but I've done over 300,000 flashcard reviews over the past few years. Um, last month, I just hit my 2,000 day streak. Um, so I've done two flashcards for over 2,000 days. Um, if that's not like the nerdiest thing to say. Anyway, um, anyway, the lesson I want you to get out of this is Try everything twice. The first time is rarely the best. Uh, particularly in medicine, I found like, for example, as a dermatology resident, complex medderm is quite frustrating and difficult at first because it's so complicated. 
And sometimes I walk into the room with a rash and I, I don't even know where to start with the differential. And that's not very enjoyable. Um, but as I've learned more and as I've gotten able to make that differential, it does quite, to, it, it is quite fun. And I am able to really help those patients. Um, so try everything twice, you know, don't, don't judge a book by its cover. All right, well, back to the uh, breaking the mold topic. So I wanted to really touch on this because I, I feel like when I was a student as a pre-med all the way up, even into residency, I feel like there's this constant pressure that I need to be a certain type of person. How, how many of you have been told you need to do research and leadership and service to get into a residency program, right? Um, so th they want us to be a certain type of person. Now, are all of you gonna be researchers? Not necessarily, right? Um, so, you know, back in BC, we had this ancient form of travel and then we developed cars and then pretty shortly after that space travel and now we have technology is advancing at a rapid pace. Education on the other hand is kind of in the same place that it has been for quite a while. Maybe we have whiteboards instead of blackboards and some textbooks are on your iPad instead of a, a textbook, but for the most part, things haven't changed. Um, now, about the time I was starting medical school, this trend was starting to be noticed, and this is a publication that was made in JAMA that I thought was really interesting. They started to talk about the self-directed medical student curriculum, so medical students were starting to teach themselves a lot more than previously. Um, they highlighted here that this was a survey of over 13,000 students and from 2018 to 2020, so that's when I was starting med school. And the amount of them who reported almost never attending lectures increased from 26 to 37%. And I'm sure that number has continued to gone up, go up, especially with uh, COVID and everything. But this is pre-COVID. We were already starting to see those trends. This article also talked about how 70% or more of medical students were using Anki. And, they, uh, and even more than that, were using some of these outside resources, um, which kind of led to the creation of what I like to call the uh, Anking School of Medicine. Um, and there's stickers out here afterwards if you want one. Um, but um, so I want to take a break from the Anki story actually real quick and tell you about another instance I felt like when I was kind of in this, this point of my uh, career and learning. I told you about the uh, global health and humanitarian work. That was something I was really passionate about. Well, I found out early on I was interested in dermatology. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do that. I met with advisors. They told me the things I needed to do. At the same time, I was meeting with the person that was in charge of the global health track. And I told them I was interested in dermatology, but this, I also wanted to do global health. And they told me that I would probably uh, spend my time better if I just did research um, and that I shouldn't do the global health track. That was a little frustrating to me, as you can imagine. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's not that I didn't like research. It's that that's something that I was passionate about and had been looking forward to since before medical school. And I was being told not to do that. Well, after thinking about it quite a bit, I finally came back to them and I said, all right, I want to do research in global health. And so I joined the global health group and I went and did multiple research projects in Ghana. It was fantastic. I got to work with these Ghanaian medical students um, and had a great time. We ended up publishing from it. So I didn't do the global health track, but I did get to do global health and be involved in quite a bit. Um, the lesson here is if what you're passionate about doesn't fit the mold and just make it fit. Um, and I think that uh, this is a really difficult thing to grasp. I think many of us get worried, we get scared, especially with how competitive residency is to get into, that we're doing the wrong thing. Um, you'll notice as I go on here, I'll start talking about how much time I started to put into Anki, which was a kind of a nerdy thing. Uh, the people I was going to be interviewing with definitely didn't know what it was and probably wouldn't understand what I was doing making a YouTube channel. Um, and I had to make consciously make the decision that I was going to spend more time on that instead of on research and other things that I was being told to spend time on. Um, one thing that I actually learned this week, the person who was running the TikTok for me and doing a lot of the onking stuff uh, has been interviewing for uh, uh, residency programs right now. And she was told not to list that as one of the major things on her uh, application. Well, she ended up putting it as one of her three noteworthy characteristics because she felt like that was part of her personality and who she was. She was asked about it in every single interview. So the lesson I want you to get is, is just make it fit. Do what you're passionate about. All right. Well, uh, the story really starts here with the Zonky deck. Um, this was about seven years ago. Somebody went and published these flashcards that were made for medical students based off of all of the most common resources that medical students were using at the time. Um, so here's the, uh, a couple of the resources. So again, um, how many of you medical students used one of these resources? Yeah, 
pretty much every single one of you, uh, I, I would guess, uh, and maybe more. All right, he outlined in the Reddit post um, what resources he used to make each section of the flashcards. But again, it was these common resources that everybody was using. Now, one of the problems, and he mentioned this at the bottom, was there were subjects that he had not covered, some of them being really important, like microbiology. Well, this led to the development of multiple other add-on decks or different versions of the deck that kind of looked like this. So there was the Zonky deck initially, and then there was somebody made the Ultra Zonky deck or the Blue Galaxies deck or the LOL Not a Cop deck or the Dark, Don Dark Zonky version. There was a whole bunch of different versions, and I kind of looked like this when I was trying to explain to people what the difference was between all of them. But the way it worked with the software was you had to pick one of those flashcard decks or the versions of it, and then you were stuck with that for the next few years as you were studying. Um, the problem was, like, like I said, it was incomplete. There were errors. Um, and, and so it, it was a difficult decision that people were stressing out about. Well, when I started medical school, it was a couple friends of mine. And we were kind of the Anki nerds. And we were helping other people to get started with Anki. Uh, we made a Word doc and kind of passed it around. And it, it was kind of fun to find out the same things going on at your school here. Um, but uh, what happened was, I found myself teaching the same few things over and over to my classmates. Uh, and they wanted me to sit down and help them. They'd bring me their computer and say, hey, I don't understand the settings or whatever it may be. And I was spending maybe an hour or more a week sometimes. And it was taking away from my study time. Um, I was happy to do it because I enjoyed helping people. But it was starting to become quite uh, busy. And uh, so what I did, what, what happened was a uh, strep throat. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't me that got strep throat. It was my wife. And she claims that all of the rest of this is because of her. Uh, so she takes credit for all of it. Um, but what happened was she got strep throat over Thanksgiving break. Um, I was quite bored because I couldn't go anywhere and I was taking care of her. And so with a little help of QuickTime, some Apple headphones and PowerPoint, I made 10 or 20 YouTube videos that I created for my classmates um, to answer those questions that I found that people were, were asking. Um, I also, uh, like any good medical student, decided to procrastinate. Uh, studying and I was in the library I designed this cute little logo on uh, PowerPoint uh, well, I, what I didn't know at the time was that the Comic Sans font that I had used was apparently the worst so uh, font ever as uh, ruining PowerPoint presentations there's even a, uh, a petition to wipe it off the face of the earth um, so anyway apparently I, I screwed up there I even used it in the thumbnails and in all of the text of the videos um, but that didn't stop uh, almost half a million people from watching the videos. Um, and the lesson that I want you to get out of this is, is don't worry about what other people think about what you're doing. Just start helping people. That's what matters. Um, because then those people will come to you and, and, and it will start to be helpful for them. I did eventually get some professional help and graphic designers and it all worked out in the end. So... <laughs> Um, all right, back to the updating dilemma. So like I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of different versions of these flashcards. Um, there's things that are incorrect in the flashcards, uh, and they're getting increasingly incorrect because medicine is changing over time. And um, anyway, it, it was difficult. Well, I had this idea that maybe we could update these and combine these and, and have a way that we could um, you know, progressively update this over time. So I posted on Reddit about it. Uh, you can see this was five years ago. And I said, hey, if anyone's really good at coding, could you help me? I have this idea. Well, uh, I had multiple people comment and say, why does this even need to be done? There were a couple people that said this were, was a dumb idea or messaged me and said, like, this just can't be done. Um, there was eventually one person after I posted a couple times um, from England that messaged me and said, hey, I understand what you're doing. And I think I could help to build a prototype and we could do this. Um, this ended up getting what we call the special fields add-on. So Anki's open source, which means the code is public, and you can build add-ons into it. It's kind of like a Google Chrome extension that you can download. Um, so we made this add-on, and you had to open this file and edit it where the green text is there if you wanted to use it. Um, so it was anything but user-friendly, but it did work, um, which was the cool thing. So we now have the ability to update the flashcards. Um, I eventually did kind of help to teach myself a little bit of Python and, and we paid for some more help and simplified that a little bit. So it does look like this now, which is a little bit easier to use, um, but still quite complicated. Uh, enough so that when I was making video tutorials for people to learn how to use it, I started the tutorial saying this video is long and complicated. You may need to pause multiple times and that's exactly what you wanna read when you're just trying to download some flashcards, right? Um, <laughs> 
So it was really complicated. Um, so to give you a better idea of what was going on and why this was so difficult. So here's a flashcard example. Now say somebody caught this and realized this should actually say synthase, not synthetase. I say, so that's great. So I import that card from that person and now the card looks like this. Well, then another person says, hey, I want a bold 5 fluorouracil because it'll help, you know, like I can quickly read the flashcards, it's bold. So I say, great. So I import that flashcard from that person and now the card looks like this. Um, so we've reverted the change that we previously made. Um, now this gets even more complicated when you consider that there's the front and the back of the flashcard, there's images. And sometimes we wanted to include images from Sketchy and from Physio. And sometimes we wanted to change the tags around and delete tags. And then there was even the question of everybody wants to write their own notes on the flashcards because you have your own way of remembering things and you have to connect it to lectures. So this got really complicated. How do we keep that without uh, overwriting it? Um, well, this was how we did it at the time. We created this massive Google Sheet. Um, you can see there's over a thousand, you probably can't see, but there's over a thousand rows. You don't have to take my word for it. People would submit to this and they would write the original front of the card and then what needed to change and why they'd provide a rationale. And then I would go and change that in my set of the flashcards to make sure that it didn't overwrite something from the previous person, right? Well, the problem with this was that sometimes people were wrong and you can see this person was nice and helped me fact check and went and commented on here and said, this person's actually not understanding the card correctly. It ended up being that sometimes around a third of the suggestions that were made were incorrect. Um, you have to consider this as people that were learning the material and didn't quite understand things. So for example, what was the first line treatment of C. diff? There's a flashcard from the original deck. Who's the smartest person in the room? Who should we ask? Smartest person in the room? What's the first line treatment? You can shout it out. Not according to this flashcard. <laughs> right? So this is wrong. This is in the original set of the flashcard. This is what it was back in 2017 when the flashcards were published. Don't worry, it is oral vancomycin. Now, um, the flashcard looks a lot better and we've updated it according to the guidelines as they've changed over the years. So just to give you an idea of like why these needed to be updated, right? Well, we've also updated it so you can add your own notes. We've added sketchy images, physio images, uh, there's pixarized images, boot camp, uh, links within the flashcard. So the flashcards is way more complicated, right? That's what's been added through the updates. And then this is an example. This is a Boards and Beyond video, which is a common resource med students are using. You can see there's a cardiology section and then the anatomy video. Um, so what we did is added tags to the flashcards. You can see there's a Boards and Beyond tag, the cardiology section. We go to the intro section and the video for cardiac anatomy. So now you can watch the video and do the flashcards and watch the video and do the flashcards. It makes studying incredibly efficient um, and students were able to spend a lot less time trying to figure out what to study and a lot more time actually studying. Well, as we did this, um, the bros deck that I've put here in green was released back in 2014. That was the first Anki deck to kind of trickle its way into med school. And then the Zonki deck was released back in about 2017. I started the YouTube channel here. And this graph shows the number of people that were subscribed to a subreddit where everybody was sharing these things. You can see as I started to release these versions of this deck update every couple months, um, things started to grow and grow and grow quite quickly up to the 150,000 that are subscribed today. Um, version 12 is now on Anki Hub, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, these are my rough estimates of how many people had downloaded those flashcards um, based off resources I was able to use. And the special fields add-on, which, like I said, people told me was dumb and not needed, has been downloaded over 300,000 times now. Um, so pretty cool. Believe in yourself. Um, even though, you know, I had this idea of something that could happen and people were telling me that it didn't make sense or couldn't be done, um, but it only took that one person to follow me and believe in me uh, to really change everything. Um, and remember, too, as you guys get further in your careers, that you may be that one person that believes in somebody else and helps them to start a revolution as well. All right, well, this didn't come without problems. Um, there were many. The updating problem, like I mentioned, was uh, quite complicated. Well, this guy messaged me on Reddit. His name's Andrew. He's a software developer by trade, and he saw what we were trying to do and was just interested in Anki, thought it was really cool, and we started to add flashcards for step two. But there were a lot of duplicates because stuff that's relevant in your medicine rotation is also relevant in your surgery rotation. Um, and he saw a way that he could you know, create some software and help us to pare down those duplicates. 
I said, that would be awesome. So we volunteered his time. He wrote some software to do that. And as we were working together, he said, this collaboration idea you have is really cool. And I wonder if there's a way we could automate it. Well, we started to talk about it uh, in the Anki community. And this article was written as I was kind of detailing things. There was one of the developers that was really helping out on Anki at the time. And he wrote this whole article about essentially why it was too difficult and too complicated to ever be done because it is so complicated, right? And Anki is open source, it's free, and it's mostly volunteers that are providing their time to update the code. Um, so it was just not something that anybody saw was going to be solved by a free uh, solution by volunteers. Well, there was also the email problem around this time. So I'd started this YouTube channel uh, and at the end of every video, these were really intended for my classmates. And at the end of every video, I had put an email and said, you know, if you have any questions, send me an email. Well, that was fine. And I really enjoyed getting an email every week or two and helping people out. And it was great until we started to have 6 million views and I was getting 30 emails a day. Uh, it was just not something that I could keep up with as a medical student. Um, so the, the three friends and I that started this, we decided to start a Patreon and said, let's charge a couple dollars uh, and then, then we'll help people out. We tried to keep it cheap, but it was kind of supposed to be a gateway. Um, and so we did. We started to charge money. Um, we also put advertisements on, on the YouTube channel. And we were using this money to pay for things like updating that special fields um, add-on. Well, there was also this pesky virus problem that some of you may have heard about. Um, it caused a lot of maskne. It was an epidemic. Um, us in dermatology, we can help you out if you still have it. Um, and we, uh, so my wife and I, we had planned this wonderful trip to go to Europe and go to Austria. And unfortunately, we got COVID, uh, but we also were not like allowed to travel and stuff because of COVID. Well, those friends of I and this software developer that we had met, we decided let's use our time and let's try and earn a little bit of money so that maybe we could tackle this collaboration problem. And we made an online course on how to use Anki. It was a difficult, you know, it had a bunch of uh, YouTube videos out there, but we said, let's make an online course. We can, people can pay us, then we'll maybe have some income and we could potentially do some other projects. Well, as we started to get money, um, like I said, this is a free and open source community. People started to get a little bit upset at us um, for making money. We started to get people making comments like this. It was hard for me. I, I kind of had this feeling like I needed to rely on uh, donations and volunteers, and it was bad of me to want to charge any money at all, um, that it, it, I, I needed to serve people, and I couldn't do that if I was charging money. Um, it was kind of a difficult switch I had to make to decide that I was going to be okay with this, and that by making money, I was going to be able to help more people and do more things. The lesson I want you to get out of this, and this is an important one that I hope all of you take home, is that money is not evil. Um, what you do with it determines your value. Um, I think this is especially pertinent, but I'm, not, I'm recognizing this as a resident. And we oftentimes, being a doctor is our identity. Uh, and people will make fun of you, they, or you will have patients make comments to you about how much money you're making. Um, and, and it is hard for us to separate ourselves. Sometimes, like I said, they expect you to serve. And if you're charging any money, then you're not serving, you're not helping. Um, and this is really difficult. You'll find this as you become a physician and you want to work with drug companies. You know, are you a sellout or are you trying to work with the drug companies because you really want to help your patients? Um, this is a difficult topic. Well, um, I had to make this switch and it was hard. Uh, it took, I, I don't want to say this was a quick thing. It was like over the course of years, I had to change my mindset that I was going to be okay with making a little bit of money so that I could do more things with it. So we decided to uh, have this trial with about $3,000. We said, let's make this collaboration thing. This was the more money than I'd ever had on my hands to do something with. We got a software engineer. We said, let's do it. It didn't work at all. Um, it just kind of crashed and burned. And if we realized anything, it was that we were not anywhere closer to getting there than we were when we started. Well, Andrew, the software developer that I'd been working with, he found this company that said that they, they thought they could get this off the ground. They wanted $60,000 uh, 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 for a three-month commitment. I, there was no way I was going to do that. I was, I was living off of student loans. I, um, I didn't want to take money from investors because I, my priority was to becoming a good doctor. And my priority was to my family. And I didn't want to feel like as a busy medical student and resident, I needed to do something or I was going to worry about getting sued or something like that. So um, I, I was kind of ready to give up on it at this point, to be honest. Uh, and figured, you know, maybe somebody else will will manage all of these flashcards down the road. Uh, I had spent hours and hours going through that list, right? I was hopeful maybe, maybe that would be the solution and there just wasn't something better. 
until one morning when I was up studying early before I think my family medicine rotation and I got this email. Dear team of the Anking, dear Nick, your work has helped me and surely many others. I would like to donate some money so that you can maintain and grow this project. Is there anything bigger you're currently working on? The question might be hard to answer, but which amount would make a real difference? Just name it. I said, that's very kind of you. Anything goes a long way. Right now, you know, we're putting money towards add-ons and our big expensive project is Anki Hub. That's the collaboration project. And I said, there's donation links on the website. So he sends me another email and this is all like within the course of an hour. I'm up studying and I'm just getting emails back and forth. He says, I hope you don't feel uncomfortable discussing this, but would about $10 for your work and Anki Hub be a smart choice? I said, $10 would be greatly appreciated. We will definitely put it towards good use. Thank you again for your kindness. And this is the exact email conversations, by the way, that happened. He sends me another message, just another question because I want to make this donation as effective as possible. Would you have bank details for me so I could directly transfer the money? Firstly, because uh, it would save you some money, I think, because it's a bigger amount. And secondly, because PayPal is giving me some trouble. I said, did you mean $10,000? I thought you put $10. Now, you're all thinking exactly what I was thinking, right? This is a scam. This is a scam. Okay. Uh, now, I, I guess at 5 a.m. thought I would have a little bit of fun with this. and said. Well, we would appreciate that. We'd be happy to jump on a Zoom call. You know, there's no way that the scammer is going to do that. So I sent this email and he says, a Zoom call sounds great. I'll be flexible anytime today. <laughs> okay. Are you available right now? I can hop on right now. He says, sure, here's a link. And I went and talked to this guy for about 15 or 20 minutes. He told me about how he'd received this inheritance from his father. Um, he loved the Onking project and everything that was going on. And about a half hour later, I got this email that said he was sending me 20,000 euros. Uh, and you can imagine what my wife thought when I went and woke her up and said, somebody just sent us $20,000. <laughs> and she's thinking we got scammed too. Um, the lesson here, if you work hard, others will see and they will offer to help as well. Uh, this guy, you know, like I say, he just had gotten an inheritance and he decided to help. Like I said, we needed $60,000. This was about 25. We had a little bit of our own from that online course. And there had also been uh, another person that had been donating a few hundred dollars here and there to our project early on. And I, I gave him a call and I said, hey, would you be willing to donate a few thousand dollars or maybe more? And I told him the situation um, and he agreed to donate the rest of the money. So pretty soon we had $60,000. So we decided to take a leap of faith with that and start Anki Hub. Um, it was kind of it was a three month journey. This was right when I was starting residency. Um, so you can imagine it was, it was pretty wild. As we ended the, the, near, the end of that uh, three month period, I started to realize that we actually needed about three and a half or four months to get this off of the ground. Um, well, we definitely did not have enough money to keep this going. Um, so we decided to change things up a little bit and launch it before we were really ready to do that. Um, I had attended this uh, lecture that was by, uh, you, you've probably heard of the echo stethoscopes. Uh, there was one of the CEOs uh, or, or the founders of the echo stethoscopes. And he said, the one advice he would give to entrepreneurs is launch before you're ready. And that kind of like rang in my head. And I said, let's do this. Um, I was on my medicine rotation as an intern. So I was working about 70 hours a week. And I think I put 40 or 50 hours a week for a couple of weeks um, into launching this, but we got it off the ground. I'm glad I never have to do one of those weeks again. Um, and pretty soon we had a software where you could submit something and as soon as it was approved, it would be automatically pushed to the thousands of people that were subscribed to that deck. Um, it worked beautifully. It also allowed for rejecting things. Um, and overnight, it was a pretty big success. Um, so you can see this started in July of 22 and then um, it has really taken off and continues to grow um, quite rapidly. Um, so the lesson here is launch before you're ready. Um, I wanted to try a little, a little bit of the entrepreneurial advice into here and, may, and some of you may end up going into that uh, or it may be that you have something you're trying to help people with and the advice I would I, I would give you is just get it out there um, and then you will you'll be able to tweak it as time goes well this is what Anki Hub looks like it's kind of cool so you can see the changes that uh, somebody has made in this suggestion um, you can see exactly what was deleted what was added you can see up in the top right there's uh, a like or a dislike button uh, there's a rationale that somebody has given for why they wanted to change this flashcard. Um, we also added it so that you could have a community discussion. Um, like I mentioned, there, there sometimes are incorrect submissions. So we needed a way for the community to jump in and say, you know, this is incorrect or this needs to be changed or I don't like this. Um, we also made it 
so that you can protect fields. Like I mentioned, you needed to be able to protect your own notes so that you can write your own notes in the cards and keep those. You can also protect your own tags if you want to tag things. Uh, and then this is something we came up with that's a little less known, but we came up with optional tag groups, which means everybody, all, all the people that are subscribed to that flashcard deck get all the tags and everything. But only the people that check this box, so for the, in this example, the University of Utah box, only the people that check those would get the University of Utah tags, which are the ones that I added as I was going through my curriculum in medical school. I tagged each flashcard according to which lectures um, I was doing. And there's now been over 200 groups of people that have tagged this deck of flashcards according to their curriculums uh, or, or, or classes or whatever it may be. We've also worked with most of the major companies in the medical school community. Um, I've worked like hands on hand. I've met with Dr. Ryan uh, uh, with all of these. We actually recently Dartmouth School of Medicine reached out to us and we've been working with them to get all of their students Anki Hub and test it uh, in that environment as well. Uh, there's a company in uh, Brazil that's been doing it and sharing it with all of their students and creating their own flashcards. Um, there's over 40,000 people now subscribed um, to the Anking deck for uh, it is now for step one, step two and step three. Uh, oh, and you can see in that picture as well, if I go back to it, there's been over 200,000 flashcard updates. So while previously I had made, you know, a few thousand and I personally had gone through each card, now there's been over 200,000 uh, changes. And then uh, this is multiple other flashcards that have now been uploaded to the Anki Hub site. So there's anesthesia, there's uh, anatomy, MCAT. Um, there's all sorts of different specialties and people are now collaborating to make flashcards in multiple different areas. Uh, this is the dermatology flashcard deck. We've almost got 3,000 um, subscribers to that. I started it uh, because I wanted to use it as a dermatology resident, and it's been fantastic, and it's my primary resource as a derm resident. I took this off the website just to see. I was curious, where in the world are people using this? Uh, and the answer is all over the world, which is really cool. Um, so where is the future going? That's a good question. I'm not sure I even know. I think you know many of us, AI is getting into technology, and I think certainly into the education realm, uh, makes sense. Uh, it'd also be interesting, you know, medical students are very dedicated and willing to do flashcards every single day, which the spaced repetition algorithm requires. You know, I did flashcards on my birthday. I did flashcards on Christmas. Um, it'd be interesting to see how can we get this into other areas of education where students are maybe not uh, that motivated to do flashcards as often, but still want to benefit from the spaced repetition uh, methods. I took this picture a couple of years ago. I thought it was funny. Somebody uh, commented on Reddit uh, on when a deck was released and they said, I really wish there was a platform where we could share and compile Anki cards. And somebody said, I'm sure there will be in a few years. And we just entered med school a bit too early. Um, so yeah, and so, you know, whatever you think, I'm sure in a few years, things like that will continue to head that direction. I wanted to talk about something that was really important to me. Uh, so like I said, we launched Anki Hub early and uh, it, it was, uh, we got it out and then there were a lot of features that still needed to be added. We, we pared it down to the bare bones of what needed to get out there so it was functional, but there still were a lot of things that needed to, in fact, up until just uh, last week, you weren't able to suggest deleting a card. Once you added it, it was there permanently. Um, so a lot of things needed to be added. But before we did that, I told my business partner, Andrew, I wanted to make it so that every single student could access this regardless of their ability to pay. Um, so we created this, we uh, coded it into the software, a scholarship program, um, where anybody can basically go onto the site and say, uh, you know, I'm not able to pay the $5 a month. They can put in whatever they can pay or, or get free access. Um, one of the goals I wanted was that everybody could have access regardless of their ability. Um, and I know that, you know, especially medical school is, is a financially stressful time. Um, as you guys go into medicine, remember that $100 might not break it, make it or break it for you, but it, it, it might really change the life of somebody else that you're dealing with. Um, all of you are likely going to be in the top 1% financially uh, in the world, uh, and your capacity to change the world is going to be pretty incredible because of that. The most important part, and this is the wise words of my dad, um, the things that you will not be able to buy are your time and your health. Make your priorities your number one passion. And this was one of the biggest lessons that I learned as I was going through all of this, because a lot of times you want to do as much research as you can. You want to do uh, as much service. And like I said, I was spending, you could tell, a lot of time on the Anki Hub projects. Um, and the most important parts uh, are really going to be the things that you need to focus on, because you won't be happy uh, without them. And he, he's actually sitting over here. He's been real quiet. <laughs> He just turned one month. Uh, my daughter just turned three years. So 
And I wouldn't be able to do this without them by my side. My wife has actually been involved in everything from designing t-shirts to helping with social media and everything behind the scenes and um, taking care of, uh, of course, these two and making sure my life stays in order so that I could work on, on these projects. Uh, I want to end with this. This is from that book that I mentioned at the beginning. In our lives and in our careers, whether we are aware of it or not, we are constantly navigating a path by deciding between our deliberate strategies and the unanticipated alternatives that emerge. And this was certainly an unanticipated alternative for me. Um, it still is. Sometimes I wonder, do I really want to put as much time into this as I have as it continues to grow? Um, uh, but I'll read this one again because I feel like it's so important. If the decisions you make about where you invest your blood, sweat, and tears are not consistent with the person that you aspire to be, you will never become that person. Uh, and like I, like I told all, all of you have an enormous potential to change the world. So what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm.